All right, welcome to Convocation. <laughs> My name is Parker Spencer. I'm the triathlon and cycling coach here at Liberty. Um, you guys can go ahead and be seated. So how many of you knew that we had a cycling or triathlon team here at Liberty? Or how many of you did not know we had a cycling or triathlon team at Liberty? Yeah, perfect, you're exactly why I'm here. Uh, one of the things I hate hearing is when a junior or senior um, joins the team and they say, man, if I would have known about this team when I was a freshman, I would have joined a long time ago. Um, for those of you who don't know, Liberty has the best club sports department in the entire country. And I truly believe that. <laughs> uh, we run our club sports department much like a D2, D3 NCAA program, um, which is unlike any other school that we compete against. Um, the cool thing about our cycling and triathlon team is that you can join one of the teams with no experience whatsoever. And um, if you work hard at it and you follow the plan, then there's a possibility you could walk away a professional athlete by the time you graduate. And I can say that because it's happened multiple times. And most recently, in the past two weeks, I went down to New Orleans, Louisiana um, with Megan Merriman, who is a senior on our team. <laughs> And Megan placed six overall in a national championship against the top girls in the country. And she qualified as a professional triathlete. And the cool thing about her story is she joined the team um, as a sophomore with no prior experience whatsoever in endurance sports, really. She played basketball and volleyball when she was in high school. Um, so she joined the team when she was a sophomore fell in love with it, worked hard at it, and now she's gonna be graduating not only with her degree, but also as a professional athlete. Uh, <laughs> um, people ask me all the time, why, it's, why do you do a triathlon? Why are you doing cycling races? Because basically the name of the game is how much more you can suffer compared to your, most, your closest competitor, and you're pretty much uncomfortable for the majority of the race. And I think the rest of my team who's sitting down here uh, would agree with me that um, this is one of our favorite ways to worship God. So God has given each of us a passion for this. And not only are we worshiping God by being out into his creation um, in the outdoors, but we're also worshiping him by really experiencing what our bodies can do. So if you're interested in the cycling or triathlon team or any of the 40 or so club sports programs, we have a booth up um, outside of the seats. And um, I'll be down here in front of convocation after to answer any questions, or you can email me at pjspencer at liberty.edu. Um, now if you could direct your attention to the screen, we've got a short video. Appomattox is a very small school, we're uh, about 700 kids. I guess it's your prototypical small town. Everybody's there to help everybody else. The town is a small one. Everybody cares about everybody else. You know, when somebody's hurting, you try and jump in and just help them. They are a great community of people that uh, support the kids. Um, our kids have learned through their sport, football, and uh, their community things that they do, you know, how to give back. Appomattox in the last uh, last year or so has had uh, just an incredible tragedy. Of course, it was a regular school day, and we were starting to get some messages in that some things were, were happening, and word started trickling through that there had been a, a tornado. It actually touched down five miles south of the high school. So I just sent out a text that said, anybody uh, that wants to help, uh, this is what life is about. This is what we're learning about in football. This is what we're learning about every day. We talk about being a winner. If you can help, it's time to step up. His philosophy is that the team needs to, uh, to work hard to get better every week. Um, the power of one uh, came about last year, uh, each one playing as one unit. Uh, the kids could trust in the person next to them to have their back. One team, one vision. It is the community. It's, it's not about us. It's not about football. It's definitely not about me. It's about a community that struggled together and became just a stronger community. Power of One, you can go into any of the stores and you just see it everywhere. You know, and people, when they see Power of One, they think Appomattox football. And they think, you know, a season that changed history for our school, for our community, um, where these boys could have given up easily. He challenges them to be better and to do better every day. As a 
coach or even early on, uh, I knew just coaching wasn't just football. It was a lot Keep more about One, two, three, uh, okay. ministry and, and helping uh, others and helping kids to realize how what they can learn through football can help them in life. Well, hello, Liberty University. My name is Coach Morgan Hout, and uh, I would like to introduce the young man that you saw on that video, he and his wife. Uh, stand up, if you would, please, Doug and Susan. I coached Doug when he uh, was a player here. And you know, one of the things that I've always said, I'm sure, Doug, you remember me saying this, maybe not, I said so much stuff, but uh, that uh, you made me a better coach. Doug Smith, you made me a better coach. As well those other kids then, but they're men now. Uh, and I'm so privileged and so blessed to have coached a young man like Doug Smith. And you know, he's not some famous guy from wherever, he's from right here in Appomattox, Virginia. And uh, that's why I wanted so much to be able to honor him here today, is because when we were here, Dr. Falwell used to talk about all the time, going out and doing it, going out and getting the job done. And uh, Doug Smith is doing that. He's not making millions of dollars a year as a famous professional athlete, but I'm as proud of Doug Smith and what he's done for God there at Appomattox as I am for any of those guys that uh, were able to go to the pros, you know, Eric Green and Wayne Haddix and all those guys. So uh, I'm very, very blessed to have been around you, Doug, and you bless me every day with your faith, which is genuine, with your work, work ethic, which is genuine, and all that you're doing. And uh, so, thank you again, Liberty. Now, I think it was on the, on the video where you can vote for Doug Smith in the National Coach of the Year. And it's very easy to do. And uh, you just go to themostvaluablecoach.com. Themostvaluablecoach.com. And uh, Doug's too humble to say anything like that, but I'm going to be his mouthpiece here today. I would encourage all you Liberty students to go, and I know you're computer savvy. I know I have two, I know I have two fingers, that's how I do it. But uh, uh, you're computer savvy, the most valuable coach.com and you'll see Doug's picture up there. We tried to get him to get him to put Susan's picture up there, but they wouldn't do it. So, uh, but anyway, so thank you for being here and being a part of Liberty. And, uh, you know, we say around here a lot, it's my privilege. Well, I'll say this to you, Doug. It was my genuine privilege to have had you on our football team and been able to coach you. You are one in a million. And Susan, he, you are too. Let's give Doug a hand. Thank you. Two quick announcements. Um, we have Student Life that's here with us this, uh, this day. They're going to be in the quarter. Uh, they are looking for applicants who want to work for their camp ministry during the summertime. Go check out their table. There's also going to be about 150 different organizations here this week with the fair. You don't want to miss those opportunities to go and get involved and in, 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 um, just, you know, chance after chance for you to go and, and make a real difference in the world. Also, there is no Campus Com tonight because we begin the volleyball tournament the Big South Volleyball Tournament this weekend. It's going to be pretty awesome. Go support that. I know that uh, our own team is going to be playing, but we're hosting the whole tournament. So make sure you, you find yourself in the Vine Center in the next few days, uh, and you're a big part of that particular opportunity. All right? Uh, our speaker today is um, as someone who, for all of our upperclassmen, is no stranger. Right? I know that uh, for 13 years, 
Johnny served faithfully here at Liberty. He started as an associate and worked his way all the way into campus pastor and the role of senior vice president. Uh, today, he heads up the Kairos company. He and his team do all kinds of consulting, all kinds of work with ministries all around the world. His book, Defying ISIS, uh, is a bestseller, which will be available in the bookstore today. You want to make sure you get that. Uh, Johnny uh, is a dear friend of the school, and, and even though he's no longer on staff, continues to be a real advocate for you, someone who really cares about you. We're just excited to have him here to open God's Word. Come on, put your hands together for Johnny. Johnny Moore, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I am uh, very, very, very happy uh, to be back uh, to, at Liberty today. I, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for President Falwell, for uh, Pastor David inviting me back. You know, David Nasser, when I was a student at Liberty, uh, literally, when I was where you are, we used to bring him in to speak, and he, he ministered a lot to me. He had a role in transforming my own life. And so, when, when God led me away from, from this university, uh, I, I, was, I was burdened over the lives that I had invested in, many of you and, and you know, some of your older brothers and older sisters now. And I was at such ease to know that, that Pastor David was on the case. And so it's a, it's a real privilege uh, to be back at his invitation to, uh, to speak to you today. By, by the way, I have uh, my wife and two kids here, Andrea and Edward and Catherine. They're down here. And uh, Edward was born here in, in Lynchburg, and Catherine uh, was born in California. So Edward's three and a half now, and Catherine is two. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to being in town for a few days of, of uh, Thanksgiving. You know, I, I had something like five or six messages I wanted to give to you today. I mean, it's been an incredibly, incredibly difficult decision for me. And so I can only give one, right? I only have a little bit of time uh, here, here this morning. And so, so I've just decided that the rest of those messages I'll just kind of put out on Twitter over the next couple of days. So, you know, I'm at Johnny M on Twitter I'll, I'll, you know, about God's will and about all these other things that were on my heart to share with you. But, but I, I couldn't share those things with you because I, I sort of have this agreement with God right now that I will take every opportunity I can to be a spokesperson for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have no spokespersons. I, I feel this personal call and responsibility in my life I have to speak up for Christians around the world who don't enjoy the religious freedom that we have in our country, that don't enjoy the religious freedom that you don't even recognize that you have by the privilege of studying at this university. Actually, in some ways, that religious freedom is under threat in this country. I, I live in California now. Uh, just earlier, earlier this summer, we had a bill that was going through the California State House, and the bill would have, in effect, eliminated Christian universities all across California. That's what it would have done in the United States of America. There's an attempt to marginalize and to discriminate against Christians in our own country in certain circumstances. And yet, there is no comparison between that Though, though everything I will describe to you today began with actions like that, to, to the comparison of what's happening to our brothers and sisters around the world. And so, so this morning, I want to tell you some stories, I want to give you some perspectives, and I want to call you to act. And for me, it all began in 2014, just after I had left Liberty. One night, I, I was in, in Beverly Hills, California, having dinner by accident with the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. There's a thriving Jewish community in Los Angeles, and I'm involved in several organizations as a Christian in, within that group. And this evening, I was sitting around this table, and everyone was my age. I'm 33. They were in and around my age, a little older in, in some cases. And yet it became apparent as, as the discussion around the table continued that every single person sitting at that table was the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. And it was an, an astonishing, astonishing thing to listen to them tell their stories, and their stories were different. Some, some families, they hid the fact that they had survived the Holocaust. They, they didn't want that to be a part of their family story. And so some of these men and women only found out late in life that their grandfather actually had a, had a tattooed number on his body. And others of them, it had been part of their family narrative forever. They, they had talked about it endlessly, saying never again, never again, reflecting back to that moment when so many millions were killed and displaced at the hands of the Nazis. 
And, and I remember getting in my car that night, and, and I, I didn't live very far away, just a, a couple of miles away. It is Southern California. It could take three or four days to go a couple of miles. You know, there's, there's a lot of traffic and a lot of time to think in the car. And as I was driving home in the car thinking, uh, this thought landed on my head. My, my thought was, like, had I been alive during the Holocaust, what would I have done? Would I have not been courageous enough to speak up? Would I have acted like the problems weren't as bad as they actually were? Would I have believed the propaganda that was coming from, from the Nazis? Would I, would I have been a courageous person? Would I have stood up for those who were being persecuted? Or would I have just acted like it didn't happen? Because that's a choice that we have to make in our lives very, very often. You have to make it in your own life. And, and, and it is not an easy choice when you have to stand up against the crowd to speak the truth because the truth is what's right. You know, the, the, the word of the year at the Oxford English Dictionary, the word of the year this year is the word post-truth in the society that we're living in. And I remember driving in my home, reflecting on these conversations I just had, and when I got to my house, I, I opened up my, my inbox from a day of emails. You know, I, I'd been gone all day, I had so many emails, hundreds and hundreds of emails, and one email caught my eye because of the subject line. The subject line said, awaiting death. Let me, let me read you this email. Just within an hour after that dinner with the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, I opened my inbox and here is this email I had in my inbox. Subject line, awaiting death. It's from a pastor in Syria. He's typing on a cell phone and he wrote, I am here in my room sitting in the darkness because we now only receive one hour of electricity per day. It's around midnight. I'm waiting here with others in my building as we play hide and seek with death. As I write, another two mortars fell on the building in front of us, and another on the building to the right, and another on the building the next street over. So far, we've been spared, but are we next? When will it be our turn? Should I just stay in my bed so that I'll die in peace? Or should I go to the ground floor of the building so that I might be able to escape? How long should I stay here? He's typing on his cell phone. Should I try and sleep or is it better to stay awake to feel the moment when death comes riding in on one of those mortars? Wow, he types. Just now it finally hit us, shaking this big building that I'm living in, the windows pushing out violently, and I can hear the horrifying screams all around me. Yet, except for that single flash of lights, there are no lights. I can't even see what's going on. I can only hear it. I think I've decided it's better to stay in my room and await death. Another mortar just hit. I'm just going to be quiet. I, I know that Iraq and Syria is another world away. I know that those problems seem so far away from us today. But if you believe the Bible, there's one thing that is crystal clear in the Bible, and that is that if you are a follower of Jesus, we are one family, one family. And when one member of the body of Christ suffers, Paul wrote to Corinth, we all suffer. It's our family. And so that, that email hit me like a ton of bricks. It landed on side, inside of my heart. It showed me, it reminded me that this, this is not just some pastor in Aleppo, Syria. This is my brother in Christ, and he is suffering, and he is suffering incomprehensibly. And Jesus cares about that, and he cares that we care about that. And in, and in America, I've got to tell you, we have a tendency not to care about things a world away in our individual lives. But, but it is our 
our responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ to step into that gap and to pray for and care for our persecuted brothers and sisters. And, and, and I have to give a startling statistic to you this morning, and that is, and you may not believe it, but it's true, Christianity, our faith, is now the most persecuted religion in the entire world. Our faith is. And we have seen a drastic escalation in Christian persecution around the world. There, there were double the Christian martyrs in 2015 as there were in 2014, as there were in 2013. Exponentially it's growing. And this isn't just like the opinion of Christian organizations. The, the Pew, one of, one of the, the great research organizations in the entire world, just released a report in June, and they said that in 108 countries around the world, 108 countries, it is dangerous to be a Christian. Christians face persecution in 108 countries. And it's not just the scale of the persecution we're witnessing around the world, it, it is the intensity and the brutality of the persecution. We're seeing first century persecution in the 21st century. I mean, if this is an issue that you've cared about in the past, and maybe you don't care about it at all today, and I want you to listen really, really closely to me, because I think if you don't care about it, I don't mean, I don't mean to judge you. The worst thing to do is to judge you. Jesus said, do not judge. I, I, I don't mean to judge you, but if this doesn't bother you, maybe you want to just look in your heart just a little. For, for many, many years when Christians are persecuted around the world, you would have to just smuggle the stories out of those countries because they were hidden. It was underground. It took place in the shadows, in the darkness, in underground prisons away from the public eye. That, that is what has been normal for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and centuries. And yet what we've seen in recent days in America, uh, through, through the American and international media and around the world, is that we're seeing persecution against our brothers and sisters in the way we saw it in the first century, on public display in the Colosseums. You saw it in, in February, just over a year and a half ago, when, when 21 Christians were lined up on a beach in Libya and they were killed there in that grotesque and brutal way. You remember it, right? In, in a video that was entitled, A Message in Blood Written to the Nation of the Cross. And yet, you should never watch that video, but if you did watch that video and you speak Arabic, you will see every one of those Christians in public display, losing their lives for Jesus Christ, praying to Jesus and confessing their, their commitment to Jesus in their dying breath, because they love Jesus, not just enough to live for Him, they were even willing to die for Him. Why, are, why do we struggle so much to live for Him when so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are so willing to die for Him and die again and again and again around the world that we're living in today? In Egypt, we saw in, just in the last few years more persecution against Christians in Egypt than in the previous 600 years combined. It, all around the world, this is escalating, and mainly at the hands of terrorists, but also at the hands of communists. You know, 20% of the world still lives in a communist country. And in communist countries like North Korea, there are 70,000, a minimum of 70,000 Christians in prison today for their faith. Within China in the last year, between 12 and 1,700 crosses have been removed from churches all across the nation of China, all across the nation, literally in the same way that ISIS went and broke crosses off of churches in Iraq, between 1,200 and 1,700 churches have been by government sanction removed from, crosses removed from churches all across China. This is the world that we're living in today. And if we don't care as followers of Jesus Christ, as people who share the same faith and religion, how can we expect secular humanitarian leaders around the world to care about these issues? But see, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ, they're family. You know, if I walked up on this stage here today, and we were in the middle of the, of the second Iraq war, and if I would have walked up on this stage, say during Veterans Day, or, or you know, a, a, a celebration of our armed forces, it, it, and David Nasser had introduced me to you as someone whose brother died in Iraq in the service of our country, you might have given me a standing ovation because of the sacrifice, as you should for those of us who, who've given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. If, if he would have said, here's Johnny 
anymore. And, and his family gave an incredible sacrifice to protect our freedom. And we would have celebrated that. And yet, why is it that as in brothers and sisters in Christ, and the Bible teaches us these are our family members, we just don't care that much. And we must care more. You know, when ISIS was moving across a nor- northern Iraq uh, at, at the height of their, of their uh, march, they went from house to house identifying, identifying Christians. They, they, would, they would, after a while, rather than asking the parents if they were Christians, they would start asking their children if they were Christians, and the children faced the same fate as the parents. You know, the, the slave markets that you've heard about and have been talked about many times here, but we have a tendency to forget that it's not just Iraq and Syria, because the world allowed terrorists in Iraq and Syria to kill Christians and Yazidis by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands or displace them by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Because the world allowed that to happen, persecutors all around the world feel emboldened to do the same in their countries. So that in the northeast of Nigeria, it, in three states in the north east of Nigeria, 70% of the churches have been destroyed and their members killed for Jesus Christ in northeast Nigeria. You know, five years ago in the world we we are living in now, there was one failed state in the world. It was the state of Somalia. Now Somalia is a failed state. Yemen's a failed state. Iraq is a teetering state. Afghanistan is a teetering state. Mali would have been a failed state had the French not stepped in. Libya is a failed state. This is the world that we're living in today. And at the heart of it, at the very heart of it, where these nations are falling, our brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering. And I know maybe you think that Christianity began in Nebraska somewhere, but it didn't. It began in the Middle East. It's a Middle Eastern religion. T- Ten years ago, there were like 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Now there are like 200,000. In Syria, five years ago, there were as many as 2 million. Now there are 400,000. These are our brothers and our sisters in Christ. But those, those are big numbers, right? I mean, they're kind of hard to get, get our head around. But what about their faith? And what if it was your family? When, when the terrorist in Nigeria, Boko Haram, started attacking villages in, in this particular state in Nigeria, they, they were attacking the Christian villages and the Christian churches solely because they were Christians. It's the only reason why they were doing it. They were, they were forcibly converting people or killing them. That, that, was, their, that was their tactic. And, and when they arrived at Rose's house, Rose uh, lost her husband and her children immediately in, in that grotesque way that they killed those Christians on that beach in Libya. Immediately. And she went running, running, running out of the house, screaming at the top of, their, of her lungs. And the terrorist said, all you have to do is say, Allah Akbar. Say, Allah Akbar. Confess your religion into Islam. Convert to Islam. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. And every time Rose told us when we interviewed her, every single time they said for her to say that, she said, I responded with the word Jesus. They said, say, Allah Akbar. I said, Jesus. Allah Akbar. Jesus. Allah Akbar. Jesus. All she had to do was say Allah Akbar, and she would have been fine. But she loved Jesus. She loved Jesus enough to be willing to sacrifice for him. You know, a few years ago, when, when uh, um, 240 girls were famously kidnapped from a school in Nigeria, you know, we all went crazy with hashtags, bring back our girls around the world. P- but people what was missed in so many of those stories is that those girls were Christian girls. That's why they were attacked. And we interviewed one of their moms, and I, 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 her, her name is Hannah. And, and Hannah describes that night, she said, we lived near the school. We heard gunshots coming from the direction of her boarding school. Lord, my daughter. We running out of the house, and on the way we met one girl, and I, I asked her, where are the girls? Where are the girls? And she responded to me. She said, I don't know. And I just kept crying. Where is my baby? I called her name, Abigail. Abigail, where's my baby? Hannah told us, I, I talked to many girls 
Many, many girls. I, I tried to sort out where my baby was. I, I have a cousin who is with her who escaped, and she said Abigail was in the truck close to the river, but Abigail couldn't jump out of the truck, and so she couldn't make it. She couldn't escape. My baby was not yet 16. Now she's 18. I am hoping that one day we will see her again. Prayer is the only key to success. With God, it is possible. He is a great God, my baby. What if it was our brother and sister, our child, our friend? See, see, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven, the gospel that we believe in, we put our trust and faith in, he says it's like a treasure that was hidden in a field and someone sold everything he had and he bought that field to get that treasure. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl, a very, very valuable pearl, and a merchant who owned a jewelry shop, he sold everything he had to buy that, to buy that pearl. Like when we look at these stories and we're like, okay, but, but if, if they want you to convert, why don't you just say, like, I confess, I, I convert, but, you know, as, you know, if you are a Baptist, like I'm a Baptist, you don't believe you can lose your salvation, right? So, so if you just like say, I convert, and as Americans we rationalize this, then, then I'll live to fight another day and I can reach more people for Jesus and all these other things. But when you sit down and talk to your brothers and sisters in Christ who actually face that question, they, they say, they have often said to me, in fact, how can I convert? It's not even, that's something about the way they view their faith compared to the way we view our faith. And some have to get Jesus, and yet Jesus says when you see how amazing He actually is, you'd be willing to give everything away to get this one thing, but it's free. It's free. It's an amazing story Jesus told in that, in that moment. He, he describes how we find Jesus. Like some of us, we stumble upon Jesus as we're going through life, sort of unexpectedly remove someone that, that shares faith with us. We stumble upon the treasure in the field. And some of us come to Jesus a different way. We're searching, we're searching, we're searching, and you try other religions, you try to find satisfaction in prosperity or in power or in popularity. You go down different paths to find whatever, and you find Jesus. Some of us went searching for Jesus, others of us stumbled upon Jesus, and yet whether you were looking for Him or whether you stumbled upon Him, whether you, some dude just shared Christ with you on a street, or whether you got to the end of your rope and went down every other path and found Jesus to be the truth. However you come to Jesus, however you came to Jesus, Jesus says the reaction ought to be the same. You see, Jesus is the most valuable thing in the world, and you would be willing to give everything away to get this one thing, and I think that Jesus means a lot more than we give Him credit for, and that is the testimony of the persecuted church. Jesus said, the man who loves his life in this world will lose it. But the man who hates his life in this world will gain eternal life. I don't think we love Jesus enough. And because we don't love Jesus enough, we don't understand what our persecuted brothers and sisters go through. And because of that, we don't care. What if Jesus is worth so much more than we give him credit for? And what if Jesus requires the same commitment from us as He requires from them, even though we don't suffer as they suffer? See, we can get very caught in our lives, right? I mean, you're the millennial generation. I happen to be a millennial too, barely. I've just kind of barely got into it. And we're a very self-oriented generation. I mean, we created 
the selfie stick. Okay, that's our contribution to the world, the selfie stick. We created Facebook so we can brag about ourselves and look at everyone else bragging about themselves. We're self-oriented. But you know, the first rule of Jesus isn't self-centeredness, it's self-sacrifice. It means when it's right, you stand up no matter what anybody says about it. There was this famous moment, by the way, in Scripture where, um, where uh, people said to Jesus, they say, why is Jesus hanging out with all those people? They were tax collectors and sinners and everything else. And, and, and Jesus' response was, these are exactly the people I ought to be hanging out with. Why am I hanging out? Because these are the people that I'm, I'm here to be, to serve. The radical Christian life says, it's more about others than it is about myself. I find a way to sacrifice and give to others every single day, and it pays up. It just pays up. You know, I, I, as I walked in here uh, this morning, I, I met several students from my era here, and, and, I, I, and they all told me stories of things I didn't even remember till they told me, and then I remembered. One, one student who stood on this stage earlier, I, I, I met him back here uh, one night after a campus church service, and he, he felt like he wanted to serve the Lord more with his life, but, but he only saw one path, and that was a path of ministry, but he was a really good athlete. And as I talked to him about, about his life, I said, if you're really good at sports, maybe God has called you to be a professional athlete. Like, don't, don't, don't forsake that in order to serve God. And you know what? You know what? He stood on this stage here today, you know, as, as, a, as a leader in sports because he saw that Jesus wanted him to follow this path and he was obedient. It all just sort of adds up. But the path to follow Jesus is a path of daily self-sacrifice. I, I remember that day, actually. I was busy. I needed to get out of here for something else. And yet there was a student there who needed me. And because of that conversation, it affected his life in a powerful way. It was a little bit of a sacrifice. And our brothers and sisters sacrifice everything, every single day of their lives. And I think it says something about our heart more than it says about their sacrifice. You know, when I, when I got that email, I decided to do a radical thing. Catherine uh, was one month old, but I felt like I had to go see these, these brothers and sisters in Christ myself. And so I got on an airplane and I went to northern Iraq. And I arrived in northern Iraq just a few weeks after uh, ISIS had, had moved everyone out of Mosul, the city that's now trying to be taken back by the Iraqi forces with our help. And, and as I arrived into that, into that um, part of, the, of northern Iraq, the hundreds of thousands of Christians were, that had been living in and around Mosul had been distributed all across northern Iraq. And I arrived in this city, this capital city of Kurdistan called Erbil, and the Christians were still sleeping on the streets. They were in unfinished buildings. They were in ramshackle tents. And these, these aren't like poor people. They were middle class people. They had cars and houses and kids in college and nice jobs. It's just that these terrorists came in and threatened their lives. And so they, they were totally, totally displaced and living this horrible, horrible existence. And so I arrive into the city. And you know, the one thing that struck me wasn't the squalor within which they were living. It's that these Christians had taken the cross and they had put it on their tents. They had lost everything because of Jesus. Days earlier, they had lost everything. Their homes, their livelihoods, their churches had been destroyed. Everything had been stolen. Everything just because they loved Jesus Christ. It was all gone. And yet that very day that I, was, I, I landed in the city, ISIS was on their furthest march. And they were within 20 kilometers of the city. They were within 15 kilometers of the Baghdad airport. And yet... These Christians, when they were displaced and living in tents, the first thing they did was they put a cross on top of their tent because they weren't ashamed of Jesus Christ. 
And they wanted to make sure that if the terrorist came again, they would have no problem knowing that they were followers of Jesus because the cross was there. And we just hide our cross when people criticize us a little bit, when we, we just hide our cross. And yet they put their cross plain and simple. It's because Jesus is for them a matter of life and death. He's all they have, all the hope they have. There was this uh, Christian leader whose life was radically, radically changed by Jesus Christ. And so he decided to go to preach all across the Middle East. And, and one night he, he runs into this, this man. And this man uh, was telling him a story about a light in his home that kept coming on. And so this, this, this missionary, a, a, a indigenous missionary, he, he tells him, he says, well, you know, cut it off. And he said, every time I cut it off, it comes back on. And he said, well, you know, Jesus says he's the light of the world. Maybe God's trying to tell you something. And he sort of said it half in jest. And yet that statement caused that man to read the whole gospel that night. He, he had given him a Bible. He read the whole gospel. That man converted to Jesus Christ that night. And later on, the missionary was sitting down with this recent convert, and the convert was flipping through his wallet, and outside of his wallet fell a picture of his boss, and it was Osama bin Laden. This was before 9-11. This man was in the service of the terrorists that would eventually bomb, the ter- shoot planes into the World Trade Center. And yet Jesus got to him first. See, that Christian went into a dangerous place to be a light of the world. But I wonder what would have happened had he not decided to do that. You know, what we're seeing all across the world isn't just first century persecution in the 21st century. We're seeing a first century harvest in the 21st century. So many people are learning and putting their trust in Jesus like never before in the world we're living in. We, we encountered recently a man in Iraq. His name is uh, Sammy. And Sammy was riding in a car on the road, and, and he comes into this gunfight, and he gets captured. And in those terrible images that you saw in the, in the height of ISIS, he was standing on the edge of a pit as ISIS was gunning down people. And he said in that moment, he said he, he was a Muslim. He said he remembered, he, in that moment, he remembered a television show he had seen late at night about Jesus. And he just prayed in that moment, Jesus, forgive my sins, save me. And he said at that moment, some guy kicked him into the pit and they began shooting into the pit. And the bullets hit everyone else, but they didn't hit him. And a few hours later, he left that pit, and he said, I left the pit with Jesus on my lips, and he's become an amazing evangelist all across the Middle East, sharing Jesus Christ with people in every corner, and he suffered much for it again and again and again, but he said, I'm even willing to die for Jesus. So, so I know this is like heavy, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for my first time speaking again in convocation to just kind of lay this on your shoulders, and I know all you want is turkey. <laughs> but at Thanksgiving, we remember, that's what we do, what we're thankful for. And next time, I'll give you something a little more lighthearted. But for now, I just beg you to remember your persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ that are in prison as they have never been before, being killed as they have never been before, at a moment in history of record assaults on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember that in your prayers, but also remember it in your faith. Like, let their testimony change your life because maybe, maybe you've been looking, 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 looking for what Jesus really is and you've lost it because you haven't seen it, but you can see it in their testimony. And then in everything else you do, I beg you, be an advocate for them every chance you can get. You know, in the, in the worst possible moment of, of, of division in this country, because thousands and thousands of Christians all across America and around the world raise their voices, we got Congress, both houses of Congress, to unanimously pass a genocide resolution against ISIS. Because political influence and power matters. Because governments need to do the right things. And many of the countries I just named to you here today are allies of the United States of America. And they have been allowed to do many, many horrific things. And the last thing I would say to you is 
This is not a time to hate the Muslim community. It's a time to love them as much as Jesus loves them. All of my work in the Middle East happened in a strange way. I was in a meeting in Jordan when the Muslim king of Jordan, a direct descendant of Muhammad in the Islamic faith, who is a friend of Christians all across the Middle East, asked if I and some other people would rally the Christian community around the world to help the Christians in the region because he believed Christians could be more helpful to Christians. And he reminded me of one truth, and that is that they understand terrorism well because more Muslims have been killed by terrorists than anything else. This is the moment to be a light of the world as we have never seen before. And I'll just leave you with this verse, Romans 16, verse 20. Soon the God of peace will crush Satan underneath our feet. God bless you. It would be appropriate to remind you that LU Send is doing some spring break trips where literally we're going to locations like Greece and Germany and working with those who have escaped persecution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And if you want to be a part of those kind of trips, you can go to the LU Send office and you can get information about that. Uh, Thank you, Johnny. Can we just give Johnny another hand just for a great job today? Great to have him back in the house.